The Wall Center is a business unit of Winrock International and is the host of the MGFN webinar series. The Wallace Center has been a leading organization in the movement for a more sustainable and equitable food system for over 25 years. Today, the center supports entrepreneurs and communities as they build a new 21st century food system that is healthier for people, the environment, and the economy. The center serves the growing community of civic, business, and philanthropic organizations involved in building a new good food system in the United States. In particular, we are focused on advancing regional collaborative efforts around the country to move more good food healthy, green, fair, affordable food beyond the direct marketing realm into larger scale wholesale channels. The National Good Food Network, or NGFN, is an initiative of the Wallace Center. It is structured as a network of networks, ensuring efficient flow of information and innovation from boots on the ground projects to the national level and back down to the grassroots level across the nation. The Wallace Center coordinates and supports the network. Our goals are to work with the growers to ensure that there is abundant supply of good food to meet the high consumer demand for the product, to collect and disseminate the best models, stories, methods, and outcomes, and to ensure that policymakers are informed about the wonderful successes our network and partners have had so that we can continue to increase support for regional healthy food. You can learn more about the great work the National Good Food Network does on our website, ngfn.org. We have a library of fantastic resources for scaling up good food. Especially of note is our section on food hubs. You can get there by typing foodhub.info into your browser. Uh, we also archive, archive all of our webinars there um, on ngfn.org. Please feel free to contact us. Email address is contact at ngfn.org. This webinar is just packed with information, so let me turn the mic back over to Ashley Taylor to frame the rest of the webinar, and let me give you a little uh, bio for Ashley. Ashley Taylor is a program coordinator administrator with more than five years of experience implementing and supporting domestic and international programs that serve diverse, low-income, and underserved populations and increase access to healthy, sustainable food. Ashley has a master's degree in sustainable development planning and management. Currently, as the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development, or QFED, Program Coordinator for the Wallace Center, she supports 30 grantees across the United States and is actively researching the best practices for food access, food enterprise development, regional food systems, and food value chains. Ashley? Thanks again, Jeff, and welcome, everyone, to today's Marketing Healthy Food webinar. The importance of this topic area is consistently being validated through our projects here at the Wallace Center, working to address health and equity in our food system, through our partners, and the requests for technical assistance that we continually receive. Just check out how many of you are attending the webinar today. We tailored this webinar to speak to you, the audience. Our audience represents a diverse group of people interested in this work, with the majority of people who registered for this webinar being producers, and individuals in the nonprofit and educational sectors. Also in the audience are individuals from the government and health sectors, retailers, distributors, and funders. So we have tried our best to tailor this webinar to speak to the majority of audience while also making it useful for everyone. During the webinar, you have the opportunity to ask questions, and we will also be taking a few survey polls. Please do not hesitate to ask questions or offer any suggestions you may have. NGFM plans to host more detailed webinars on this topic in the future, so any suggestions you have helps us answer to your resource and informational needs. More resources can also be found at one of Wallace's webpages, www.hufed.org. So briefly, what's the problem? Access to healthy food is a complex issue that should not be oversimplified. Food insecurity touches every county and every state of the U.S. Americans are increasingly eating wrong, unhealthy foods, which is leading to weight gain, rising levels of obesity, and diet-related illnesses. By 2018, it's estimated that obesity will cost Americans roughly $334 billion in medical expenses, and 43% of Americans will be obese. Our country, with its myriad of geographies, climates, and socioeconomic and ethnic groups and subgroups, is a diverse place. Making generalizations about underserved target groups is a recipe for failure. To address these problems, today's webinar will focus on alternative models with social purpose that are addressing a host of interconnected issues like food access, obesity, diet-related disease, job creation, and business viability as small and medium agricultural producers. 
We will talk ha about how it's more than just food access. We also need to consider the consumer and what factors impact their buying and eating decisions. And lastly, it's our assumption that there is no one-size-fits-all or perfect business model that creates both the level of social change we seek while being 100% economically sustainable. There are, however, elements of success, and today we will be looking at examples of what strategies are working. The objectives of this webinar, first, Dr. Martin Malash will introduce the topics of consumer-centered marketing and consumer behavior. Michelle Muldoon will then illustrate these concepts in the context of marketing in underserved communities, food access, and social change. And lastly, Ruby Orcosio will provide you with ideas and examples from the field and tools to get you started. So next, Jeff will introduce our first panelist, Dr. Martin Malash. As Ashley mentioned, um, th there's clearly a need for this information, so uh, we'll, we'll bring on the professor first uh, to give us the theoretical grounding. Dr. Martin Malash has been a professor, oh, sorry, <laughs> has been a professor of food marketing for over 25 years and is currently teaching at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He earned his PhD in marketing from the University of Kentucky and is author and contributor to a large number of books and papers on marketing, business, and food marketing in particular. He is a frequent conference moderator, facilitator, and speaker. He has earned numerous awards for excellence in teaching and has committed himself to serving the betterment of society in several different roles, including board memberships and international service. It is my honor to introduce Marty to you. Forgot to unmute. Hello, and I'm, uh, I'm Marty Malash, and I'm here to talk to you about, um, where's my slides? Hello? Just just click Marty and you should, oh, okay, uh, there. should right. be able to advance. All right. Sorry. All right. So if you build it, will they come? Consumer behavior concepts for effective marketing. Um, actually, I talk about it as the layperson's guide to marketing basics. So what is marketing? Well, here we see a slide, a uh, cartoon actually, Dilbert. And Dilbert said, if everyone exposed to a product likes it, the product will not succeed. The reason that product will, that a product that everyone likes will fail is because no one loves it. And what we have to understand is we've got to create a love relationship between what we're selling and the consumer. And whether that consumer has limited resources or limited access to healthy food, we have to create that want for that product. So, let me go forward. What is marketing? Hint, it's not a bad word. I know that many people think of marketing as being a negative thing. But marketing isn't. Marketers are. So when you come up with your examples, ask yourself whether or not it is marketing or a marketer. There's a lot of examples out there. Uh, being the Healthy Food Network, we're looking at... Uh, fast food restaurants, uh, you know, companies that market unhealthy food as being examples of bad marketing. But they're marketers, not marketing. So what is marketing? Marketing is nothing more than the facilitation of exchange. It's a matter of creating conditions which will allow you to exchange with your target market customers. And I'll explain what I mean by target market customers later. But I like to think of marketing as more than just the facilitation of exchange. I think marketing is really making it easy for customers to buy your stuff. And when I say buy, I do not necessarily mean with cash. There are other ways they can buy your stuff. But to take advantage of what you're offering and making it easy for them to do that. So when I talk about it in a strategic sense, I say marketing is making yourself the preferred solution provider. Now, what's, what is it we're trying to solve? This is the Healthy Food Network. So one of the things we're trying to solve is the unhealthy food, the obesity problem that exists in this country, by providing opportunities to purchase or otherwise uh, 
get healthy food. But in order for us to facilitate exchange, we have to understand that conditions for an exchange have to be met. Now, what are those conditions? Well, if you think about it, back from when you were uh, in your earth science class back in the fifth or sixth grade, you learned that there were three conditions necessary to fire. First, you had to have fuel. Second, you had to have spark. And third, you had to have oxygen. And if those three conditions were present together, then you had fire. Well, marketing is the same thing. We've got to pre create the conditions necessary for exchange. So what's the first condition? Well, the cartoon I have on the left is showing you a very thirsty gentleman coming across the desert trying to find something to drink. And that gentleman is going toward a lemonade stand. And this lemonade stand is the only place he can so get something healthy to drink. When you think about it, or something not necessarily healthy, but to drink, if you think about it, this is much like the individual looking for healthy food. They frequently are in the middle of the desert trying to find that healthy food. So we're trying to make it available to them. And the way we do that is through something we call place. There's a need for more than one individual to participate in an exchange. And you have to understand, if you can't get it physically in the hands of the individual who wants to purchase it, then you cannot make an exchange. Four conditions for exchange. Second, in the cartoon on the left, says we only employ first-class salespeople because we produce inferior products. This is one of the things that marketing's gotten uh, ridiculed or uh, uh, criticized for in the past, is that marketers just create demand. Marketers don't create demand. They create or increase demand for the products that they market. But they don't actually create demand if, the, if there was not a demand there in the first place. So the need for value. Exchanges occur because a consumer is trying to solve a problem. We provide consumers with problem-solving benefits. We call this product. In fact, what I like to say to my students in at seminars is think of product as a bundle of benefits. You've got a bag, and into this bag, you're going to put a bunch of benefits. And those benefits are what your consumer is going to purchase. So think yourself, think about it yourself. In your particular situation, what are the benefits that you're trying to provide? Third, this one's called promotion. And you see the couple on the desert island saying, do we want a platinum card? And frequently, again, marketers get accused of promoting to uh, audiences that cannot use or consume the product. We see a lot of this with Healthy Food Network in children's advertising. But the consumer has to know about your benefit package and how that package will help them solve their problems. They've got to know about you or they will not possibly make an exchange with you. So promotion is not bad any more than marketing is not bad. All promotion is is communication with your target market customer. And I said it earlier. I'll talk about what we mean by target market in a minute. And four conditions necessary for exchange. The fourth condition is, no, you can't pay for groceries with Facebook stock. It's price. Is it worth it? Your customer has to believe that the offer you have made is worth what you have to give up to get it. We call this price. But price isn't just about cash or just about money. Price is about what they have to give up. and in many cases, this will not be actually cash. Um, think about a co-op, a uh, co-op cooperative grocery out there. Okay, many of the cooperative groceries require that their members work a certain number of hours in the store. That's an additional price that they pay to get that product from you into their hands, so, so they can use it. So we talked about the target market. When I talk about a target market, what I'm talking about is the market that you're going to reach. So what you've got to ask yourself is since you can't reach everyone, since you can't interest everyone, who works best for you? 
the cartoon on the right says, the good news, I found a new untapped niche market. The bad news is it's me, and that means only me. You can't market to a market that's too small. So you've got to define your target market in terms that don't define it so narrowly that you can't possibly succeed. You describe them. You can describe them in demographics or psychographics or uh, basically everything's based on need. So common needs that that target market may have. You profile them. Profiling means that you, it's hard to market to a demographic description or even a psychographic description. But if you know somebody who fits that description or a group of people who fit that description, think about marketing to them. So you may say that the individual is an upwardly mobile female who is currently making uh, over ten thousand, uh, over forty thousand dollars a year, a professional, and has an interest in the outdoors. That's great, but it's much easier to market if you say Mary or Sue or Joanne is that person. So consumer behavior, you know. All the books have different definitions of consumer behavior, but they all come down to one thing, and consumer behavior is the behavior of consumers. Uh, I have a problem with that because that's what consumer behavior is, but it's just redundant. When it comes to your target consumer, the important thing to understand is you have to understand them and where they are. What motivates them? What leads to action? And how do you reach them? I use a model called the AIDA model named after the opera. And it says attitude, you've got to create a positive attitude toward what you have to offer. Interest, you've got to create interest in it once you've got the positive attitude. Desire, you have to create the desire to act on that interest and then action. You have to create a way for them to act. And all of this leads to marketing strategy which is a matter of taking a target market and a projected image and matching them. And the darker, the tighter, the thicker that arrow between those two, target market and projected image, the more loyal that customer is to your product. So let's say you've got a, uh, let's go back into the cooperative. You've got a cooperative grocery store and you've got membership in that grocery store you suddenly find that your membership is beginning to fall off. You ask yourself, why is membership falling off? Well, part of the problem may be that your projected image has changed. They now perceive you as being too high priced, or your product is not being totally organic, or not being totally healthy. So you've got to do something to correct that image in order to create that link with that target market that segment of customers selected because you can address their needs effectively. We've got on here a little cartoon. I, I like to kid the kids about it. Uh, my kids meaning the college kids. And that is that, that some generations think, let me see, if I've got this right, you want to skip all the steps and just go straight for the money. But many times marketers are guilty of the same thing. Marketers think, you know, this is easy. All I've got to do is build it and they will come. The fact is, that's not true. You've got to build it with them in mind, and you've got to build it with a, a, a unique image that addresses your target market customer. So here we have three distinct examples of food stores aimed at different targets. The one on the left is Aldi's. The one in the middle is Trader Joe's. And the one on the right is Wegmans. Now, we say target market like the target market is distinct and would only shop at, let's say, an Aldi's. But we do, what we find out when we do market surveys is if you went into Aldi's, you would find a price shopper who's interested in purchasing private label product, not branded product. And what you have at Aldi's is you have all private label products, even though they may have a, something other than the Aldi label on them. But they're all at a very, very low price relative to other competitors in the market. So 
Aldi's is extremely successful. In fact, currently, right now, Aldi's is the fastest expanding chain in the country. And sometimes we say fastest ex expanding, and we're talking about a chain expanding from three to five. In the case of Aldi's, this is thousands of stores that they've opened. And now they're opening in uh, more uh, well-off na neighborhoods. Trader Joe's. Trader Joe's, believe it or not, is owned by Aldi's, or the same parent company owns both of them. They both use the same suppliers. But Trader Joe's has a reputation for having a lot of um, organic and uh, niche products that are trendy. Trader Joe's really likes to say that we are the shopping experience, kind of a treasure hunt that you go on when you go in to Trader Joe's. The third one is Wegmans. Wegmans, for those of you who do not know of them, uh, is a very high um, profile chain on the East Coast. They are devoted, as you can see by the lower picture in the lower, most of their store, 50 percent of their store is devoted to fresh product and prepared foods. And they've got everything. They have Chinese, they have Mexican, they have organic, they have vegetables, they have salad bars, and it's all theater of food. So, that's the third one. Now, as I said earlier, sometimes we think of the target market as being distinct. But as you see on the slide, the same customer may shop at all three on different occasions. If they're coming home from work and they need a quick meal, they may stop at Wegmans and go into the prepared foods aisle. If they're currently entertaining and they want to have something unique for their table, they may shop at Trader Joe's. And if they're doing their everyday shopping, they may shop at Aldi's because it saves them money. All right, at this point in time, I would like to turn it over to Michelle. And Michelle, where are you? Okay. Michelle, you're going to uh, talk about, what are you going to talk about? Oh. <laughs> I, can, um, I can do Michelle's intro, that's fine. Thank you, yeah. Marty. Thank you. Um, uh, so Michelle, um, as Ashley mentioned, um, she's going to start to help us to understand how we can apply the principles that Marty was talking about to social food marketing. Michelle Frain Muldoon, a biracial, bicultural, Asian American, is a program manager and food marketing specialist with more than 17 years of ex uh, experience designing, improving, and running complex social change projects in some of the most impoverished and underserved parts of the United States and Africa. Her skills and experience span social change, social marketing, health, diet, and nutrition for healthy food marketing, food systems and regional economies, working with people of color and historically disadvantaged groups in many more areas. Muldoon created a self-sustaining business skills training center that still functions today in Togo, West Africa. Uh, and she was a marketing educator to U.S. family farmers working at the Rodale Institute. Michelle currently managed the HUFED program, the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center uh, at the Wallace Center. Michelle? Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Dr. Marty, for laying out the, uh, the theory of marketing, which can be very complicated to some, including ourselves sometimes. Uh, in this section of the webinar, I'll provide a little bit more detail about consumer behavior, give you some examples. The outline for this agenda, this presentation, is I'll go through some context and assumptions that we're coming from. I'll talk about consumer makeup needs, focusing on the underserved, social marketing and community development, and why that's an important component to what we do. The four Ps, as Marty described, we'll go through examples of real life, um, examples of the place, product, promotion, and price aspects of marketing. And then we'll talk about key takeaways and a call to action. So you'll be able to walk away from here with tools that you can start using today. So why consumer behavior? Well, when you understand the behavior of consumers, you can create products and services that provide the consumers with more value. And then you can market those products and services in ways that consumers understand. 
The whole point of studying consumer behavior is to motivate customers to purchase. And that's according to Consumer Behavior for Dummies. And in our case, um, we also are able to adopt or promote positive social change um, through, through our uh, consumer behavior efforts. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Defining your consumer, uh, you'll hear that our, you know, our mantra around here is, you know, food access is not just about access. It's kind of complicated, uh, but if you do your research and kind of get a, a better understanding of where the consumer is coming from and you really position yourself and focus first and foremost on that consumer, you can build your whole marketing model and your business um, strategy um, and your targeting around that knowledge. So we talk about market segmentation, consumer segmentation. So Here's some ways you can define your consumer. We have household size, income and education, age and gender, geography, whether they're urban, rural, or local, they, that needs to be defined, what race, ethnicity, culture, what subculture within ethnicities and cultures, uh, where do they shop, how do they shop, what's their history, lifestyle, traditions, personality, willingness to try new things. Uh, and the bottom line around this is to never, ever assume. And another indicator that we have seen is that poverty and education are the leading determinants for poor health. And so I think that it's very important for us to understand where income, jobs, and poverty tie into this. And overgeneralizing can be very dangerous because in the case of Native Americans, for example, there are more than 565 federally recognized American Indian tribes. So it's, it's very difficult to generalize. And then you can't generalize between new immigrants and, you know, the next generation of children born here in the U.S. I include this slide simply to illustrate what Ashley had mentioned earlier um, about the, the epidemic, epidemic um, of, of obesity. And what we're seeing is that, you know, the biggest fear is that this generation of children will die before their parents will. And if you look at the latest data, according to Kids Food and Beverage Market in U.S. Packaged Facts, um, you'll see the breakdown of what kinds of foods are being marketed to children. And as you can see, 0.1% is produce. But what do the other things show us? They give us ideas. So let's define underserved consumer briefly. Um, I spell this all out because I think it's really important for us to understand and, and be on the same page with this. Uh, we developed this definition through a advisory council of food access experts from around the country, which included people of color. Our definition for underserved consumer is Underserved consumers, our communities, are those in both urban and rural areas which are historically disadvantaged or excluded from mainstream networks of support and investment. Underserved communities include those which are low income, have high incidence of diet-related disease, including obesity, as compared to the national average, and they have a high rate of hunger or food insecurity and severe or persistent poverty. So as you can see, it's not just about race, it's about poverty, education, geography, history, and a whole host of other things. Tailoring to the consumer needs. First, you have to understand what are their needs. And you can approach it with a WICM strategy, we call it, what's in it for me? So what's in it for them from their perspective? Research shows that location, 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 location is the number one um, determinant of where a person's going to shop, if it's convenient. Uh, it's also important to understand time use. There is an American time use survey, I, I believe it's ERS, um, USDA does this every year. And it, you know, what are people spending their time doing and how much time do they spend cooking? Price and value is extremely important given that we're dealing with consumers with limited income. Cooking inclination and knowledge is also important. Personal values, you know, what's important, and what are their attitudes for health and other labels like sustainable and fresh and organic and things like that. The bottom line is be realistic. According to a Gallup poll uh, done recently this past summer with the question, overall, how healthy would you say your diet is? Very healthy, somewhat healthy, not too healthy, or not at all? Only 24% of the people in this country said very healthy, with 51% saying somewhat healthy. So there's room for improvement for all of us. and. It's to note that. So thinking outside of the box store, we can learn a lot from the food industry is the number one thing that I always promote. Look around and be observant. Marketing to children, fun, small size branding. Convenience is critical. Prepared, pre-processed, think out of the box on that. Location, where can you meet the consumer where they are? Mobile markets, buying clubs, drive-throughs. 
consumer education and promotion do intersect. And so when you're talking about nutrition education, that is a part of promotion, which I'll talk about later. The shopping and eating experience, the event of it, the fun of it, the entertainment of it. And what you can do immediately after this webinar is find the low-hanging fruit. What is available for free? And I'll talk about that later. So what's critical to the work that we do in the world of community development and international development and domestic development is it's critical to understand the concept of social marketing. We are sellers of social causes, according to Philip Kotler, an uh, academic post focused on marketing. He defines social marketing as applying marketing concepts and techniques to the promotion of social objectives, such as brotherhood, safe driving, and family planning. There is an insider and outsider mentality that we have learned about in our own experience and through the research. Trust is absolutely key. And when I say insider and outsider, again, it is not just based on where you come from or what you look like or your race. There are also other factors, including age and your gender and your education and your class that will make somebody either connect with you or not connect with you. So you need to find your local champions, your leaders, your bridge builders. I call them my translators, people that are trusted in the community that kind of pave the way for me when I get there. So you need to change strategy as well because some of the strategies will, will yield immediate results, some will be a midterm result, and some are going to take years to start. So you really have to know where people are starting from in their whole community growth, uh, development, life cycle, and business life cycle, and where people are in terms of healthy eating. A community assets approach is really important with collaborative marketing and synergies, looking at social services and nutrition education in the schools, uh, and investing and in working in communities that have that multi-sectoral strength to support and enable the healthy eating behaviors for the long term. And again, I, I'll repeat this over and over, meet people where they are. It's absolutely critical. Okay, here's a recap of the four Ps. I'm not going to go through this, but I put the slide in here as a reference so that everybody would have access to it later. There are questions in here that you can ask yourselves. The four piece of marketing, um, following on to how Dar Dr. Marty laid it out, will be product, product, price, place. promotion, place. Okay, place, yeah, place first. Okay. Um, when we talk about place, we're talking about hours of operation, being open when you say you're open, customer service, comfort, ambiance, do I feel comfortable walking into the store, is the store clean, accessibility, parking, safety, uh, there's convenience and time use as well, thinking one-stop shop, you know, when people have to pay for a bus to go to the grocery store, the one-stop shop becomes all the more critical, and thinking in terms of your consumer and about all of the segments of travel that they've got to do to pick up their children and drop their children off and go pick up the laundry or pick up the, the groceries and, you know, stop over here. So metro stops, churches, barbershops, retirement homes, catching people where they congregate normally is very good. What we're seeing in some communities in the Deep South, for example, you know, people go to church numerous times a week and it serves as a hub for community, brotherhood, education, and other things as well. And learning from the food industry, delivery, drive-through, curbside pickup, these are really critical, especially for people who are on the go, busy, or moms with children in the backseat. Examples of place include Detroit Economic Growth Corporation, um, Farm Stand in a grocery store parking lot in Detroit, and they're working in synergy with the produce manager in the store, and it's a win-win for both of them. In St. Louis, we've got the Farm to Family Naturally uh, mobile market. They're setting up at Metro Stops, among various other places. And then we have Mogro in New Mexico. It's a converted commissary truck marketing to Pueblos in New Mexico. And here's one from the traditional food industry that uh, we actually saw, um, we learned about recently. And it's True Bethel Baptist Church. It's a Subway franchise that was purchased by a church as a means to uh, vitalize the economy, create jobs, and that kind of thing. Product, positive experience, appealing, relevant, accessible, information, signage, packaging, merchandising and display, product branding, is it culturally appropriate, food safety and quality. What is the message that your product display speaks? Does it say old and stale or I don't care or fresh, clean and tasty? Um, logos and cartoons are also very, very powerful, especially with children's marketing. So what does your product say? Fresh, clean, safe, convenient? Is that what these pictures would tell you? 
And it's also really important, I think, in our business, we're learning that, you know, it's not just about fruits and vegetables. It's not just about from scratch cooking. And we need to think out of the box. And going back to the pie chart of the children's foods, and if you look at just the food industry and food marketing in general, looking at snack foods and, you know, really thinking out of the box beyond just, you know, the traditional what, you know, setup of a produce um, aisle or a farmer's market. So here's some examples of the food industry ideas that apply to what we're talking about here. So we've got, you know, snack foods for children. We have ready-made coleslaw and barbecue mixes. It's an innovation. It's a product development. We've got the convenience aspect of fresh cut produce already packaged for on the go. And for promotion, again, nutrition education does tie into promotion. So if you've got information about the MyPlate, the USDA information, you know, put that together. 10 reasons to buy local. There's a lot of information available online for free that you can print out and use as part of your marketing. Consumer campaigns like Buy Fresh, Buy Local, Buy Detroit, Buy Traditional, Heritage. Bilingual signage is absolutely critical whether or not your consumer speaks English or not. It does lay the, you know, the, the it, it creates a feeling of, of openness and accessibility and comfort. And instructions, guidance, recipes, navigation, helping the customer to be able to get around and be able to feel like you know they know what's know they know what's going on, and using the Walmart example, having greeters, you know, and if your audience is predominantly you know Spanish speaking, have a Spanish speaking greeter who really gets it and is passionate about the topic area. Product branding, radio, newspaper, TV shows, there's a whole lot more under that. What's really important, I think, is that the story that you know all of you who are on this webinar right now are working in social change and your story adds value. And what are you trying to say? What is that story? Is it very important to, to capture and don't underestimate the value of that story? Is it empowerment, self-determination, a sense of place? Is it buying local? Is it sustainable? Et cetera, et cetera. There's bilingual signage. And I also encourage you, I'm not going to I'm actually going to skip ahead to the next slide, but I really encourage everybody, you know, talk about looking at your competition. In other words, looking at who is competing for the dollar that we are trying to, um, in, in the target audience, the target consumer that we're trying to reach. It's also, you know, very easy to do. You can go to a discount store like all of these and just look around. You can, you know, the sales circulars that we get in the, in the mail, you know, take a look at them and just start observing them across the four keys. So price, people love free, free samples, free bonus, buy one, get one free. There's all kinds of different strategies. You know, just look in the newspaper, the Sunday paper, the circulars, the ads, you'll see them. Buy 30, get $5 back, like CBS's extra bucks, rewards, there's loyalty cards, um, there's incentives, financial and otherwise. Uh, and just echoing what Dr. Marty said, what do you have to give up? So price is more than just financial. What do I have to give up? Because I'm going to count my travel costs and my time and you know everything into that equation. Um, on, okay, and of course, you know, from a supply chain perspective, you can increase efficiencies and reduce costs, and that's a separate topic area around creating your price that, that we'll, we'll cover in another webinar. Uh, but that's also another strategy. Coupons, there's double up box for the value of your dollar can buy more healthy food. Um, and, you know, just for getting the research, you're wondering, you know, well, how do I start? I've already laid out some ideas. You know, pre consumer research doesn't have to be fancy to be effective, and you can start that today. You can be curious, be objective, and listen. Your consumer knows more than you might think, so be sensitive, humble. Don't be afraid to say, I don't know, and have your consumer explain. Validate their knowledge. Frame your questions and your intentions so they know that where you're coming from and that you're trying to help. Um, methodologies might include focus groups, interviews, surveys, uh, scanner data, purchasing data, EBT transactions. And, you know, the one that you can do right now, you know, as soon as you shut down your computer is direct observation, looking at signage, product, price comparisons, watching customer service, looking at the customers that are smiling. Why are they smiling? Look at the ones that are frowning and why are they frowning? And identifying and researching that competition that I mentioned earlier. Here's a, an example of a survey that you can, um, you can take a look at in, in the, uh, when you print this out. So you can start taking action now. Starting today, you can go out and define your consumer. 
and you might have more than one segment of consumers, uh, according to the definition slide that I had earlier. You can write your story. What's it about? What are those keywords? You don't have to write out a three-page story, but just what are those keywords? What are those themes and messages? Identify and research the competition and learning about poverty and day-to-day -day reality. This is really, really, really um, paramount and we are, this, this is validated every time I go out and I travel around the country that, you know, people are making decisions about poverty who have never been poor. And so it's very important to understand what poverty looks like and what the day-to-day -day reality looks like for somebody from the moment they wake up until the moment that they go to sleep. And what is it like living on $4.23 a day for food? Identifying champions and bridge builders is very important. Define your social marketing goals and what ideas are you marketing as mentioned. So in conclusion, let me repeat again, food access is about more than just access. And don't assume anything. Keep an open mind, free of judgment. Um, find and rely on local bridge builders. Anticipate consumer needs and meet them where they are and work from there. And with that, I'll turn it back to Jeff. Thanks, Michelle. That was a whirlwind and wonderful. Um, so now let's, let's uh, look more in depth at how one organization has applied all of, or, or at least many of these principles in their project. Ruby Orozco is a bilingual, bicultural health educator who earned her bachelor's degree in health science from the University of Texas at El Paso and master's degree in public health from the University of California, Berkeley. Her experience includes needs assessments and curriculum development and implementation. She planned and implemented statewide health education education activities for the California Department of Public Health. Her passion can hit, continues to be learning, documenting, and practicing ancestral approaches to health promotion. In her position at Public Health Specialist with La Mujer Obrera, she spearheads a model program that uh, ties increased local food access to culturally based nutrition education. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, thanks. Uh, Okay, great. Well, thank you very much um, for inviting us to share a little bit about our experience at uh, La Mujer Obrera here in El Paso, Texas. Let's see if I can get, oh, there we go. Um, I'll be covering today just introducing you all to our organization and how we approach food and selling food in our community, uh, how, how we know and understand our community and their needs and an overview of our different projects involving food access and uh, the promotion methods that we utilize. So La Mujer Obrera is located uh, in the Chamisal neighborhood of El Paso, Texas. And El Paso is the far west little corner of Texas wedged between New Mexico and Mexico. Um, our neighborhood is located right on the U.S.-Mexico border. And uh, it used to be the city's garment district. Um, in the 1970s, El Paso was known as the jeans capital of the world. Uh, most of the jeans came from uh, this neighborhood. We, have, we had a series of factories from very small ones that were more sweatshop type of factories to large uh, factories with good pay and benefits. And around that time, the women organized and founded La Mujer Obrera as a worker advocacy organization. Um, because most of the workers in the industry were women, uh, primarily of Mexican background, and most of them, um, you know, monolingual Spanish speakers or limited English uh, proficiency. So they were easy labor tar um, easy targets for labor abuses. Uh, so at this point, the women organized to advocate for very basic labor standards um, in their work. When the industry left, um, after the restructuring of, of global economic policies and things like NAFTA passed, um, our neighborhood was left with a lot of empty warehouses uh, and not very much in terms of community kind of infrastructure for a healthy community. So the women shifted their focus to sort of what do we do now? What, a, what kind of community do we want? Uh, what can we create? What, what kinds of dignified employment opportunities can we create for ourselves and our, our community, our children, our youth? So uh, the women have established a series of social purpose enterprises, including a daycare, um, restaurant, a fair trade import company. They knew they wanted to sell artisan goods 
um, but wanted it to, to be fair trade, um, um, you know, sort of consistent with our background as women workers, thinking about the workers of the in Mexico, the artisan workers. So um, the women have created a, a variety of different projects, um, and I'll cover the food-related ones uh, next. But I want to talk about sort of how we approach food. Um, food is inherently tied to traditions and the life with dignity, uh, food that comes from uh, a good place with, with respect to the earth and the workers. Uh, and um, so we're, we're trying to reclaim good food, uh, Mexican food as good food. I think right now a lot of people think of Mexican food and think of cheese and fried things and lard. And historically, uh, it was not so. So we're trying to re claim and remember ingredients that are very healthy as well as cooking methods like steaming and boiling and roasting uh, and promoting all these different things like seeds and flowers and different edible uh, ingredients from our diet. So for us, the message goes beyond healthy eating or, you know, amaranth, 18% uh, of its weight is protein. Uh, for us, uh, Nutrition education is very much tied to history and anthropology and sort of the story behind the food and how we're connected to it. Um, it's sort of a way of reaffirming our culture, cultural identity and, um, and strength. So similarly, uh, when we look at ingredients that way, we also look at the marketplace that way. So what is the role of the marketplace? Uh, what is being sold? Uh, by whom? And what does the process entail for the earth, again, for workers? With what intention are the products created and sold? Um, this is very important for us uh, to reconnect to the marketplace as a space uh, that's a business, yes, but also more than a business, a place where a community can share knowledge about things and support local growers, uh, eat the freshest foods, and even barter with each other uh, excess things that they may be planting in their backyard. Uh, so we wanted to really ground our, our efforts in this sort of vision. I want to share with you a little bit about what we've done in terms of understanding our community. Uh, we've done several things. Uh, we opened up our marketplace in 2009. That was a picture in the first slide, if you got to see it. It's a 40,000 square foot uh, renovated former garment factory. And in 2010, we conducted a, a neighborhood level assessment to understand uh, food, food insecurity. Uh, as you probably all know, um, the USDA does not provide uh, food security data at the neighborhood level. So we use different kinds of proxy data, like um, school lunch and breakfast program participation rates, and mapping projects of food outlets that different uh, students have conducted here in the universities, um, pairing quantitative data with qualitative data to get a picture of what's going on in our community. So our community is a very isolated community. There's freeways on all, on all sides. Um, a lot of people don't have a vehicle here. There's ex extreme poverty and, and persistent uh, poverty. Uh, the Federal Reserve Bank has recognized that our neighborhood is one of the most impoverished in the nation. And so looking at this assessment um, and all the data, uh, we decided we needed something that was culturally appropriate, linguistically accessible, and was very practical and easy uh, for people to just kind of on their way somewhere, or they happen to be at some event, and they happen to taste something that's delicious and go home with the recipe, or be able to purchase the ingredients, or be able to purchase a hot meal, um, so really to be very focused at the neighborhood level and uh, practical, bilingual, and uh, rooted in our culture. Uh, something that we've done more recently uh, over this summer was to conduct uh, food purchasing pattern surveys. Uh, we co collected 100 of these uh, to understand our, our customers. Right. Uh, so we, we realized that uh, even though a lot of our customers are low-income customers, as Michelle said, don't assume anything. Right. They, they still value quality over price and very much support the concept of uh, supporting the local farmers. Um, uh, but most of the time, they're very busy and still have to rely on hot foods, ready-to-eat foods, and sometimes even fast foods. Um, we also learned that uh, a lot of our customers are already doing their home gardening, they're, whether they're growing herbs or 
have a patch of pumpkins or corn or squash. There's a variety of things that people are already doing uh, uh, around kind of the local, local, local food system, and uh, that's really we think an opportunity to tap into their own knowledge about this. And um, let's see, yeah. So I don't know if you all are familiar with the acculturation data, but it kind of shows that um, as immigrants of any background spend more time in the United States, uh, we tend to lose our healthy habits of fresh foods and even physical activity. And I think we kind of see that here and just a, kind of reaffirmed in this survey are people that are prefer to eat at home and cook, but uh, don't have the time and are kind of in that transition of having to rely more on prepared food. So uh, these are the, the food access projects that we have to date. Uh, Mercado Mayapan, the farmer's market, uh, a nutrition education program, and a couple of new initiatives um, that I'll explain the barter market and the mobile market. So Mercado Mayapan, as I mentioned, is a 40,000 square foot uh, renovated former garment factory. Um, we have hot foods here. We have two food courts. Uh, we you can do dine-in or to-go. Uh, we also do catering uh, events uh, on-site or off-site. Uh, we have we host cultural events. We have a community museum here, um, and we we host all kinds of different events here. Uh, the way that we promote the events in the mercado uh, is kind of kind of multifaceted. So for our neighborhood, as I mentioned we're kind of very isolated, a lot of people speak Spanish at home. We do a neighborhood flyer in English and Spanish that we go door to door every week and distribute um, about 600 of them. Uh, we also have a weekly email list uh, through the MailChimp service that you all may be familiar with. And that one is in English and people sign up to be on that list and we let them know what's happening um, in terms of food or farmers market or cultural events. It's all in the same email. Uh, we allow um, media, local media, uh, English and Spanish, TV and radio. Uh, a lot of it can be free, like going on talk shows or morning shows, um, and uh, social media as well, Facebook, uh, blog, a little bit of Twitter, not so much tweeting going on, but um, uh, much more active on Facebook, I would say. And the idea is to catch people where they're at. For example, we're preparing to host our annual day of the day Dead Festival, and uh, people will be here and they'll be shopping at the farmer's market and uh, maybe taking a recipe home. So the farmer's market is in its second season right now, and uh, we, it's, we are food stamp friendly. We accept SNAP benefits uh, to the extent that we can. We try to write grants or look for resources and funding to create matching programs. Uh, we have a, a one now that allows people to uh, have a, a full match. So if they spend five dollars of the food stamps at the farmer's market, the grant will match them five more dollars. They have a total of ten dollars. Uh, we do more promotion for the season or opening of the farmer's market. Um, uh, we conducted a, an educational campaign through blogs for the grand opening um, where I interviewed different people across the food system. So from the farm worker perspective, why is the farmer's market important? From the women worker, la mujer obrera, why is it important? For the Texas Department of Agriculture, Go Texan program, why is the uh, farmer's market important? And uh, put these blogs out on a weekly basis um, leading up to the launch of the farmer's market uh, to kind of raise consciousness about why local food, why is it important here? We're really the, the first farmer's market in El Paso, Texas. Um, so we're doing a lot of that consciousness racing. And this is really good uh, for your media plan, for our media plan, because I'm able to refer reporters to, you know, this is what the Texas Department of Agriculture said. There's an interview already on our blog. And um, they like easy access to things like that. The education program, as I mentioned, it's, it's root and traditions. It's bilingual. Um, it, it ranges from a five-minute uh, sort of taste test, and here's this recipe to an hour or an hour and a half uh, class or cooking class um, or nutrition class. So there's levels at which different people with different time constraints can participate. We also take a mobile cooking cart. Uh, sometimes we use it here in the Mercado and sometimes we use it at the during the PTA meeting at the elementary school down the street or at a, uh, a community fair at the park 
or at the senior housing. So we take it out to where people are, are at, are, are already going to be. And uh, we started a, a buyer market last year. Uh, our idea for the buyer market was really to promote the notion of good food, of raw ingredients, and raising awareness about the local food system, so the seasons and what grows here, and exchanging that kind of information. Um, so the rules for the barter are homegrown produce and seeds, um, and uh, natural uh, homemade food and body care products. And we promote that in the in the neighborhood and as well as on Facebook. Uh, it's been very successful and interesting because we're, we're seeing the connection between a lot of different segments of our community, the younger kind of like a college educated, you know, people into gardening and the, and the ladies that live in the neighborhood that have been growing their own herbs and are kind of sharing seeds and sharing information. Um, it has been very interesting and, and successful. It will be a year old in December. Uh, our newest project is a mobile market in San Elisario, which is just outside of the city limits in El Paso. It's considered a colonia, and a lot of the farmer, uh, former garment workers, um, uh, when the factory shut down here in El Paso, moved out to San Elisario because the land was more inexpensive. Uh, but this San Elisario, San Elisario is considered a food desert um, by the USDA's Economic Research Service, and we have a sister organization there, Ayuda. Uh, Adults and Youth United Development Association, who hosted our pilot uh, muscle market this summer. And we took our wireless EBT machine out there, and they hosted us in the parking lot and uh, did a, a lot of the promotion for us through their networks. So that's, that's it. Uh, that's all I have. And uh, thank you so much. All right, Ruby, thank you. That's what a wonderful project. Okay, so now we want to open the floor uh, to some questions um, for, for our panelists. Please continue to, to write your excellent questions in. Um, and uh, so let me just jump right in. Um, Michelle, maybe you'll, uh, you'll answer this one first. Um, uh, there's a question that says, can you describe uh, culturally, the phrase culturally appropriate? Um, this person says uh, that I believe we are trying to change the food culture. Could culture become a barrier to this? It's a good question. I think that um, first of all, it, I, I just need to clarify that culture is a, um, I guess, subjective definition. There's a lot of different definitions out there. The way that I'm using it is to determine, is to describe, you know, a person's experiences, history, um, lifestyle, behavior, traditions um, that make up, you know, that are important to consider that make them connected to others with similar, similar backgrounds. It's a really bad definition. But um, the way that I'm using it is in the broader sense, I guess is what I want to say. Um, so it does include what uh, the, the questioner asks, which is, you know, how do you work with, um, you know, how do you, how do you work with traditions, food habits, cultures, that, um, and diets that may, may not necessarily be healthy at this point. So in this case, what we do is, again, and we look for ways to meet people where they are. And are there ways to look at the areas where they are eating where we could substitute something that's a little bit healthier in that existing diet? Um, are there alternative healthier ingredients to include in that meal or in that particular diet? And then, you know, or changing the way that they're prepared and meeting people where they are again and then just moving them incrementally along to better health and eating for a longer you know, impact some more sustainable change. Okay, great. Ruby, I don't know if you want to weigh in on uh, culturally appropriate. Can you hear me? I was on mute, I think. Um, sure. Well, I, I mean, for us, um, the idea of uh, good food is, rather than creating something new, is going back to what uh, was traditional you know, more traditional, so uh, more respect for the earth and uh, with the, you know, a, a connection to growers and to, that's, the, that's the way that we frame it often to, to ourselves and to our communities. You're not trying to create something new, but just uh, undo some of this <laughs> modern system and go back to some, a system that was a little bit more um, 
healthy and sustainable. So, I mean, that's the way that we do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, while while you're unmuted, Ruby. Um, uh, Amy is asking, um, why or how did the blogs play a key role in your communication plan? Um, uh, Amy says that um, she tends to see low-income populations without regular internet access to read the blogs. Yeah, I mean, for us, it was, it's a, a useful tool for reporters, and reporters write for papers that get distributed in our neighborhood. So um, the, the, the blogs that we put out that are tied to our communications plan um, are tools that I then use when I create a packet, say, for the launch of the farmer's market, and the reporters are coming in, I give them this packet, and they say, this is why we're doing this. Uh, there's different people I've already interviewed. Uh, involved in the food system that can explain why this effort is, this effort is important. Um, and I've already done a lot of these interviews if you want to quote any of them. And that's been kind of helpful for reporters that are usually on deadline and uh, they, they like to just have a link and go and read and sometimes they'll paraphrase what you say and sometimes they'll put the same quote. Um, but And you, I always also give them the, num the name of the person that I interviewed and their number, but oftentimes they're kind of rushing so it's been a just a useful tool for reporters, and then those those articles, those newspapers, whether they're in English or Spanish, get um, get read by our community members. Okay. Um, Kathy says one challenge with mobile markets is keeping the cost low. Uh, she has a mobile market that accepts WIC and EBT, um, but customers want lower lower process lower prices than is feasible. Um, are, are do you have any suggestions there? Maybe Michelle, you want to address that? Uh, sure. I think you know what we're finding is that you know pricing is you know it's, it's kind of complicated and it goes along the entire supply chain. So you can affect pricing with the way that you produce and your cost of production. And so the very first thing is look at where the inefficiencies are. Number one, and improve those inefficiencies and reduce your costs in terms of production and, and distribution of the product is number one. Um, assuming you've done all of that, you can also look at you know, some of the other strategies that we're seeing, especially with um, you know, the 30 grants and partners that we're working with across the country, is looking at hybrid pricing approaches where you have, and also segmenting your market. So when I talk about you know, leaving this webinar and thinking about who your consumers are, you may have different segments. You might have a farmer's market and a school and then, you know, a limited income um, area, CSA, or, you know, whatever you've got. Segment that out. And what we're seeing is that what you can do is, um, well, first of all, find your champions within that segment. And then, you know, those who are your cheerleaders, increase those who are your cheerleaders so that you've got them and there's that, that sense of security and it minimizes your risk. Then you've also got, you know, when you have a more affluent consumer base and a less affluent consumer base, you can um, do innovative pricing strategies or market in certain ways so that the more affluent are offsetting the, the costs for the lower incomes. Uh, there's different ways that you can approach that, but that's you know, sort of what we're, we're looking at. So I think diversification is the best way to reduce risks. Um, I think it's important to look throughout the entire supply chain, and it's something that we're currently collecting and going to be reporting on. And could be a webinar topic in the future if, that, if you're all interested. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, thank you, Michelle. That reminds me. Um, I'm going to uh, run a little poll here. So as you're listening to these uh, questions and answers, um, this is just uh, to give you all a sense of what you all are doing. So are you currently marketing healthy food to underserved consumers? Um, yes. I've been doing it for a while, or no, we're just, we're, yes, we're just starting, or we're about to, uh, but, or no, not right now, I have in the past, or no, not at all. So uh, go ahead, uh, your, uh, uh, feel free to, to click the uh, answer most appropriate for you. Meanwhile, uh, Marty, I have a question for you. Um, Tracy is asking about uh, how do you change the, the image of a store. Uh, she has a project where she's um, changing the, the market mix in a local corner store, uh, but they're, you know, the, the corner stores have a, a particular image. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you go about changing that image to, to uh, make 
consumers understand healthy food is available? Well, number one is that that um, you know, one of one of the things you know they they use the uh, term bodega frequently for corner stores, which is kind of a pejorative term. Corner stores aren't aren't trying to rip people off. They just have a different um, channel that they work through and so their expenses are, are higher. But when you look at the healthy food, uh, you make it available. Uh, you put a sign, you know, a sandwich board out in front of the store to let people that know that you now have uh, fruits and vegetables or whatever it is you're carrying. Um, you do uh, signage within the store. Uh, everything be, can be done because of, you want to do this uh, sandwich board because of the fact that people aren't coming into your store because they don't believe you have healthy food. The other thing you can do from the standpoint of supply chain is partner with uh, local farmers uh, to get product uh, which you can bring into your store and sell this local product as well as uh, product uh, that's healthy and good for the consumer. The other thing I would do is yeah. The mm -hmm. other thing I would do is make sure that the store looks like it's selling healthy food. So one of the first things you have to do when you're working with the, the corner grocery store uh, is to make sure that it's cleaned up, that it's uh, well organized, uh, that you don't have stuff laying out all over the place because that'll give the impression of unhealthy rather than healthy. Right. Yeah, I think just to okay. add on to that. Yes, um, please. Just this is Michelle. Just to add on to that, I think you know it's important not to go change overnight. You don't do the uh, you know the television style you know weekend makeover and suddenly it's different. So maybe you know incrementally changing it and improving it, but also making sure that the retailer is on board with it. If the retailer is not on board with it, that that's the wrong store to be approaching. Um, and then also. So being realistic, you know, I mean, what are the basic staples or even things that may not be staples or desirable that people are, um, you know, that, that they come in because the retailer still has to make money and there are some very high margin products that may not necessarily be, be healthy. And I'm not advocating for that, but it's just to consider so that you don't end up losing a whole customer base in order to get that smaller percentage of, of ones that are transitioning. Actually, when you were talking there, Michelle, it reminded me of uh, something I wanted to say, too, is, you know, you've got to make it right for the neighborhood. So if your neighborhood is, for example, um, a, a uh, Hispanic neighborhood and they got certain foods or certain vegetables that they like, let me give you an example. We've got a uh, store, uh, a food cupboard, which uh, we were giving uh, product away, and we got a bunch of uh, broccoli in. Well, the, st the people shopping in that store didn't know what to do with broccoli. So what we did is we set up a, a, a display or a sampling site, and we simply cut the broccoli in half and uh, uh, sautéed it in butter and then served it to them. And they, but they had never uh, had never eaten broccoli. They finally liked it. In fact, many of them say, "Geez, this is a lot, a lot like greens." So uh, you know, you've got to you've got to market to the people that are in the market. That's a great point. Lydia has a, a, a really important question, and I'm, I'm so glad she asked. Um, she mentions that several panelists have noted that people don't have time to cook the fresh foods that we feel that they should buy and grow and eat. So what are specific, affordable, uh, for producers and consumers, strategies that the panelists can propose uh, to address this huge barrier? So Michelle, maybe you want to take this first and um, pass it along. I think um, all of you can weigh in on this. <clears throat> I think that the most important thing, again, just echoing what Marty said, is looking at who are your consumers, looking at what they're buying, looking at what their lifestyles are. And, you know, I've once seen a um, marketing definition that says marketing is solving people's problems profitably. So what are those inconveniences and those annoyances that if you were to solve them by, say, putting together something the equivalent of a shake and bake mix, you know, or um, something that could be, you know, that would not have a huge production and processing cost. Um, now, of course, all of this is considering food safety and all of that other stuff, but looking at where are the small 
kinds of things that you can do uh, with relation to that. One of the things that we're seeing, do you want me to talk about the um, frozen? Yeah, frozen foods is also an area, when you look at how people shop, and the data shows this about how people shop and where they, how they stock up, when it, looks, when it comes to produce, a lot of them are stocking up. Um, they'll go to the big box stores and they're stocking up. They're eating vegetables, but they're eating frozen vegetables. And, you know, this is a convenience kind of thing, but it's also that it's got a longer shelf life and can be cheaper. Um, and it can also be a way to be strategic about using up seasonal product that may be, you know, you have a surplus at the end and that kind of thing. It's really hard to just give one solution without, you know, understanding the whole consumer base and all of that kind of stuff. But I think that frozen foods is an area to take a look at. Pre-processing, anytime that you can chop, you know, provided that it's not so labor intensive that you need, you know, 15 people work until 2 a.m. to chop up stuff for the next day's delivery uh, and that kind of thing. I think, you know, sort of thing. I mean, it's really just looking at how people are eating. Are they eating out of can, frozen food? Are they, do they need solutions like, you know, um, I'm seeing shake and bake back on the shelves again lately. You know, I think uh, those are just some of the kinds of ideas that you might want to take a look at. Great suggestions. Ruby, do you want to weigh in on um, how, do you, um, how do you balance healthy food with uh, limited time? Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, I'm not on mute, am I? No. Um, I, we, you know, we have in the, in the Mercado um, hot foods, um, prepared foods that people can buy to go. Um, I think the idea of marketing like a kit, like with all the ingredients, and the recipe is something that we haven't done yet that uh, we've talked about doing before. Um, uh, and I think, I've, I mean, I have not tried this, but I have heard about like cooking co-ops where uh, people kind of meet together once a week. Let's say it's five people, and then they bring enough of some freshly prepared food at home and uh, bring enough to everybody else that came here. So when you go home, you go home with four different uh, dishes that you can then refrigerate or freeze and then thaw and warm up. I, that's something that we've talked about in some of our workshops, but I've never had a group that wants to kind of go through with it <laughs> yet. Um, but I think there's, there's ways to be creative and um, support each other. Uh, you know, for us it's really important, to, and both in our mercado and at the daycare that we run, to not use um, a lot of processed foods. Uh, with, frozen or boxed, um, we, we tend to use uh, as much fresh food as possible <clears throat> because we know that um, people that, especially in the daycare or people that come and get food to go, they're, you're, they're giving up a lot of um, uh, control over what they put in the food, you know. So we know it's, we're not using lard and we're not using uh, a lot of salt and we're not using certain things. So it's really important for us to, to market the hot foods um, to the community. Great. Um, and um, Marty, I don't know if you'd like to weigh in on this yeah, uh, just, as well, but just real quickly, sure. uh, um, you know, one of the things that's underused uh, when we talk about convenience is the fact that you don't have to take, you know, five hours or six hours to prepare a meal. And if you can put recipes out for products that are in season, in simple, quick recipes. I mean, you can prepare uh, acorn squash in a half an hour in the oven. You can do like a, the saute of the Brussels sprouts that I talked about. You can do kale by putting it on a cookie sheet, sprinkling a little olive oil and salt over it, and sticking it in the oven and baking it for 10 minutes, uh, and it becomes a, a crunchy treat. So, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of simple solutions that people don't think about because they think of cooking as preparing an entire meal. And it may be, but a lot of these solutions can be added. Uh, you can suggest a lot of these solutions, but you have to suggest it to people who are buying the product. Just to add to that, Mark, um, I think it's important to, to note that <coughs> there's, a you know, there's, there's the tangible what you can deliver in terms of the product looking easy, but there's also the other P's in terms of promotion and education, and there's the perceived difficulty of something. You know, if you market something as a 30 minutes or less, you know, products, you know, it's it's easier, you know, it's, it's, it calls it out, it stands out. And so it's important to also remember that, too, that it's just um, the perceived 
um, cost or difficulty or value of a product that you can't see but that you can describe. Yeah, and I don't I don't want to um, underemphasize the the value of of sampling. I mean, if you're going to did, give them a kale recipe for a baked kale in 10 minutes that re, you know makes a snack food, uh, you know, have some samples out there. Tell them it took eight minutes to prepare it and let them sample it. Great, great idea. Um, I know I like the samples. <laughs> I, I wanted to point out to everyone that there is another poll up, um, so please uh, continue to vote. Several of you have. Um, Michelle, um, can you say more about the concept of having wealthier consumers purchases off, offset the smaller amount uh, for lower income people are able to buy? Do you, Catherine wants to know, do you mean charging different amounts for the same food at different venues? It could be um, charging different amounts for the same foods or charging different amounts for different formats of the food or different products altogether. For example, um, you know, I in one of the travels, one of the travels in, uh, in one of the states in the, in the Deep South that I was in, you know, they talked about how we, we started looking at their customer base. And so they had school, they had farmer's market, but they had farmer's markets in different areas. And so the farmer's market in the big town in this very rural area was predominantly educated and more affluent, not even talking about race, just, you know, class and education because it was a college town. And so there they described, you know, just a quick example of a product that, um, you know, to differentiate, you know, asparagus was something that the markets in the less affluent, predominantly African American communities were not eating, but those in the city farmers market just couldn't get enough of it. And so, you know, it's even, and it's even perceived as a premium product. And so there's different ways that you can kind of differentiate your product um, sometimes you sell the story to those who are more affluent and they are willing to pay more to be able to help somebody who has less. So it's all the way that you position it. But there's just, you know, I think with all of this, the answers are not so simple um, because it, it really takes understanding what, what location you're in, who the customer is, what's their age, what's their income, and all of that. But just in general, though, you can... You can differentiate, you can charge different prices, you can sell different products to different people, um, and you know, that's what the food industry does. Right. Marty, do you want to talk about Aldi's and Trader Joe's maybe in that, in that yeah, vein? That's a, that's a good idea because Aldi's and Trader Joe's use the same suppliers generally, but they um, would make, uh, let's say, a, a jam, a strawberry jam for the Aldi's, and then they'd have uh, strawberry and um, cinnamon jam from premium products with large chunks in it, and it would be a dollar more per jar, and they'd sell that at Trader Joe's, and it would be uh, Trader Jose's uh, strawberry jam. So uh, no, no, uh, no. Excuse my uh, use of Spanish because I'm terrible, um, Ruby. Uh, so that's that's the kind of thing they do, and they do it with uh, the the they have frozen fish, seafood in there that was is fresh frozen and in the, in the um, in the Trader Joe's they have quality levels of uh, premium fish and in uh, all these they'll have uh, some frozen catfish and maybe some tilapia uh, that the customers can buy and there are different profit models for both of them Great. There's another poll up, our last poll, um, and this one is uh, of should be of particular interest to you because uh, we will uh, change our behavior depending upon uh, what you do. See surveying, very, very important. There's a, a question about uh, suggestions for encouraging larger snap sales uh, for customers already shopping, say, at a farmer's market. Their, their tra average transactions are quite low. How can they incentivize larger purchases? There's already a coupon incentive program. Any any brilliant ideas? Well, number one is you know uh, you know you have to make it apparent that you accept SNAP benefits, of course, um, and there are 
we use, what we use now is actually the SNAP benefits use an EBT card, so you no longer have the food stamps. I was back in the food industry when they used to be like monopoly money trying to peel it apart, and it was very embarrassing. But I also would uh, come up with, um, um, you know, specials, and you've got to be careful about this, but come up with specials um, that would target uh, SNAP benefits. Now, you can't, you can't, you don't want to make SNAP benefits and let me think about this, how I'm going to do this. Michelle, chime in anytime you want to. Uh, all right. If you have a product that your SNAP benefit community frequently uses, um, offer that product and offer a premium uh, on that product for cash or SNAP benefits. But you, have to, you just have to call out the SNAP benefits. Okay. Um, I, yeah, can, I, can I can can I I add to that? Um, the, this was exactly the question that we had for ourselves when we, um, when we put out this customer survey, the food purchasing pattern survey this, over the summer. You know, we're trying to figure out um, what we can do to encourage more uh, SNAP use at the farmer's market. And I think that uh, something that we've started to do uh, is to promote um, the use of food bearing plants and seeds because a lot of our community is interested in home gardening and you can use SNAP benefits to buy that and we have some local suppliers of plant bearing foods and if you can tie that to maybe a workshop during your farmers market about you know how do you grow your own cilantro or how do you grow your own and maybe even involve some of the community members like we have a couple of ladies that come a lot and I've asked them if they would ever be willing to do a workshop like this and um, I think um, kind of tapping on what they're already doing and encouraging um, the use of SNAP benefits for home gardening is one strategy that we we're really uh, looking to implement um, and then again the use of if you can uh, locate uh, a SNAP matching grants or create a fund for it somehow, somehow maybe have some raffles or ask for donations for a matching grant so that um, consumers with SNAP benefits can, can have more incentive to use them at the farmer's market. That's something that uh, is generating a lot of interest in the matching program that we're about to start. Yeah, and the matching grants is the great way to do what I was talking about in that you know, you obviously can't give a special just to SNAP benefit users. Mm -hmm. Okay, there are so many wonderful questions, um, but uh, I think I think this one is is a is an important one. And oh, um, I I wanted to also mention that uh, the the poll uh, the poll results are are now visible. So Michelle, um, Kenneth talks about um, addressing violence. So he, he, let me just read his words. How do you address the issue of violence while trying to promote healthy eating and active living? I'm finding it hard to get people interested in their health if there are other factors that t seem to be much more apparent than eating healthier and being physically active. Any? Wow. Any, you know, I know it's a big one. It's a big <laughs> that's one, but a so important. So important. Um, yeah, and that's why I, I flagged it. I'm glad that um, I get a chance to, to answer it. But I think that, you know, the number one thing in community development and inter international development, again, I'm like a broken record here, is meeting people where they are, but really, first off, understanding where they're coming from, working with local champions who can describe and translate where, you're, you know, where your audience is coming from. You know, it's really, really difficult to, you know, when you look at the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, when people's basic needs aren't met, that self-actualization, abstract kind of thinking about tomorrow is, is more difficult. So another approach I might take is, you know, this is where you have to decide who you're going to target. And it's not to say that we don't care about the poorest of the poor or those that are really out there and the least, um, the most disenfranchised, but also strategically identifying who is persuadable, transitionable, who is the local role models and the leaders that could take it on and then become champions and models for others. That model has worked worldwide. Also, the systems approach, you know, creating that enabling environment, that fabric of support. You know, you don't plop down a retail store and everything's, you know, hunky-dory after that, but you have to be working with 
the local community, you know, the organizers and the community, the neighborhood, you know, watch team and, you know, that sort of thing. I think an, another aspect, oh, and just as an example of that, um, DC Central Kitchen is one great example of that. They have a training curriculum that really takes people from, you know, um, who were previously incarcerated and at-risk youth and takes them through a whole process before they even get culinary training of self-determination, identi identity, and it really breaks down, you know, who are they, what are they, and they start from there. When you look at historically oppressed communities worldwide who have been colonized, who have been dehumanized, who have been excluded from formal education and business, you know, you're starting from a different starting point in these communities. And so it's very important to have all of that understanding and to know that there is you know, years of betrayal of trust and, and things like that, and so there's a lot to work with there. One final example that I, I remember with one of our um, projects in, in Detroit, uh, with the, 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 uh, the food farm stand outside of the retail store, you know, the, the, the manager of the store was having some issues about, you know, worrying that things would get stolen and wanted to have a very tall fence. I can't remember how many feet tall, but it would have made it look like kind of like a, like a prison yard. And so we came to kind of a compromise by looking at fencing that was bright red, plastic, designing it in a way that, you know, created a territory, like a parameter, like this is offset. And, you know, the, the money and the cash register was in there, but, you know, kind of separating it, but not completely saying, I don't trust you. And, you know, that's what you see in some of the you know, the corner stores in some of the urban areas where you've got, and even in the rural areas, I saw this actually in El Paso, where, you know, people don't trust each other. Things are locked up, you know, and what does that do? That provokes people sometimes. Or it says, I don't, you know, I don't trust you. And, uh, you know, when you extend trust, you know, often you get, you get trust back and you get that respect. I know it's, it's just, it's not an easy answer. No, it is not an easy answer. Um, but we are going to end there. Um, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists, Ashley, Michelle, Marty, Ruby. What a packed webinar. Uh, seeing these different perspectives on the same concepts really makes it come, come alive. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be archived on our site with links to uh, many of the projects and re uh, resources referred to during this webinar. There are 40 plus other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to send others who you think would like to have heard this panel uh, and take some professional development time yourself. Dig through our excellent archives. Visit ngfn.org slash webinars. This webinar will be up within a few business days. Our webinars are organized into topics. If you look at the left-hand navigation area, dig into whatever interests you. We offer our NGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month uh, at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Sign-up links are at ngfn.org slash webinars. However, to work around Thanksgiving, we will have our November webinar on the 29th, so it, that would be the fifth. Uh, Thursday. The Wallace Hugh Fed Center has been uh, studying market-based food access work for three years, as you've seen, um, and we are creating a report of all that we have learned. This webinar will be a sneak peek into our insights. If some of the examples that Michelle shared on this webinar interest you, don't miss the market-based models for increasing access to healthy food, defining what works. You can uh, indicate that you'd like to be automatically registered for this webinar uh, in the post-webinar survey. Uh, and I also want you to know about three other Wallace Center websites. At the top of the webinar, I mentioned foodhub.info. That's .info. It's a food hub, hub of information, research, case studies, a map of many of the food hubs across the country. The NGFN Food Hub Collaboration recently cho chose nine food hubs across the country to work closely with and document their stories. Read about our study, study hubs on our site. There are even links to TA providers with experience in aggregation and distri distribution. If you are a TA provider or consultant on this call, you should take some time and create or update your profile on ngfn.org. Org. This is becoming an established place for those in need of assistance to find their help, so you want to be listed there. There are over 200 individuals and organizations, and that number is growing. Click on the database link. HughFed.org is our site for the Healthy Urban Food Enterprise Development Center. As Michelle mentioned, this program and website is focused on increasing access to to food to underserved communities using market-based solutions. On the site, you'll find descriptions of the initiative, grantee profiles and photos, and a library of some of the best food access resources. If you have a resource you'd like to share, let us know. Contact at ngfn.org or 
newspaper, QFED at windrock.org. And foodshedguide.org is our site for producers wanting to adapt to the changing food business landscape. We have instructive text and case studies with an emphasis on how to have a viable business in a food value chain. Learn about, for instance, factors to consider when deciding on legal, legal status, such as LLC or C Corp. Visit foodshedguide.org for more. The Women, Food, and Agriculture Network is hosting a web webinar you, many of you may be interested in attending on October 23. Join three fantastic seasoned food uh, food advocates, Dev Eshmeyer, Anupa Bhan Joshi, and S Susan Fustrell, as they talk about advocating for healthy food and farming with indifferent or reluctant audiences. Uh, unlike the webinar you're on now, there's no need to pre-register. Just visit that link I have displayed here and enter as a guest. And for those of you in the Northeast, please join me and hundreds of others at the Northeast Sustainable Agriculture Working Group's annual conference. If you are a food hub manager in the area, please come for the Calling All Food Hub pre-conference session. You can find the NGFN on YouTube, on Twitter, and on our website, ngfn.org. The Wallace Center is now also on Facebook. Come like us. Search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Again, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know in the post-webinar survey, and we'll sign you up. Please contact us at any time, contact at ngfn.org. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today and once again let me encourage you to fill out the survey that will open in your web browser in just a moment. Thank you so much. This concludes the webinar. The organizer